Hello, ladies and gentlemen out there on the interwebs. Welcome to the final episode of the James Mura Literal Podcast for 2020. I'm your host, James Mura, and this, this is a production which is brought to you in, in partnership with the Frankfurter Bookmesser with funding from the German Foreign Federal Office. I said it's the last show, so we're going out with a bang. Our guests today are Zoe Beck in Berlin. She's the one nearest to me on my screen and BC Ajapon in Germany. I am streaming in from Nairobi, Kenya. My first thing is I always ask the guests to introduce themselves because, you know, I, I might do your bios too long, too short. So uh, BC, uh, let's start with you, BC. Please tell us a little bit about you and your writing. Okay, very briefly, I'm the author of Of Women and Frogs which is published in Nigeria and it's going to be published by HarperCollins uh, next year. Uh, in, and, and that's about it. What else can I say? I am in Ghana, not in Germany, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, BC. Uh, Zoe, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, that, I, I wanted to ask BC, um, I thought you just, you were about to, to, to found a publishing house. Oh yes, my book was initially published in, in Nigeria, but uh, HarperCollins has just bought the world English rights for it and it will be coming republished again in uh, 2021 oh, in okay. the UK, yes, so Canada well. and uh, the Commonwealth countries, yes. We'll be getting into our publishing house a bit later. So okay. Yeah, so we're just trying to know who, who, who is in front of us. Um, yes, uh, my name is Zoe Beck. I'm right now, I'm in Berlin, um, freezing. It's really cold here. <laughs> um, I've, um, I'm also a writer. I've uh, written, I have lost count of it, se several novels and short stories. And um, I also have a um, publishing house, which we call Kultur Books, and we publish mainly um, international writers from all over the world. Yeah. And I'm, I, I'm a translator. Sometimes I forget <laughs> that I am. I yes. translate oh, wow. English we, into we have that in common. I'm also actually a translator. I've translated okay. many books for Macmillan. And I have also just established a publishing house in Ghana. So we have a lot in common, really. OK, so we, wow. now we know each other. Um, I'll start with you, BC. Um, uh, this is just about what's happening in your environment. I know you've had an election. Do you have a president yet? They have not announced the election results yet. And, uh, you know, this was last night was the elections and people are kind of a little antsy and just waiting. Uh, it's quiet in the country right now, but um, nobody in Ghana is interested in watching me they are all glued to the telly trying to wait for the results everybody is just waiting oh i mean um as somebody who follows african elections i must say that um your elections in ghana are very disappointing you know there's no, <laughs> it's no drama no voter rigging allegations uh it's everybody's counting the election and it looks hunky dory I guess uh, for our drama, we'll just have to uh, hope for Trump to give us some more drama. Hopefully. So, uh, no, he's he's giving us enough drama for 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 days. So let's start with the with the your uh, with the scene that you're in. When you look at uh, Ghanaian publishing uh, on you know what we know about Ghanaian publishing, um, you know some name the names that will always come up: um, Aikwe Ama, Ama Ataidu, Kofi Awono. And then the newer names are like Taye Selassie and Anya Jassi. For those who might not know anything about Ghanaian literature, would you like to tell us a little bit about it? Oh, yes. We have lots of uh, up-and-coming writers. And in fact, we have lots of writers who have you know, published wildly, uh, widely. We have Aisha Haruna Atta, for instance. Uh, she, she published uh, The Hundred Wells of Salaga and had been translated into German and into uh, Italian and uh, other publications. She's just come out with another book. Uh, the Hundred Worlds was her third book, and she just come out with a young adult book also, which is called The Deep Blue. And so uh, she's doing very well. 
Uh, we had Peja Literary Festival, and that has introduced us to a number of writers. Oh my goodness, I have this lady called Bwachewa Glover, for instance, who has written a really brilliant book called The Justice, and that is out there. We have other short story writers like Ansaki, we have Nana Aredamwa, and we have the Ayukwe Parks who is a novelist who has been doing uh, very well. And then we have uh, Nanequia Bruhaman, for instance, who wrote, uh, what was her book again? I forget the title of the book, but she's also uh, there and she has written a book and she has an anthology also coming out by Harper Collins. So it's pretty vibrant right now. A lot of young writers are coming up. Uh, we have people who are trying to go to school, for instance, to study some more. And so it's beginning to, to really pick up. I think what slowed things was that we, you know, we went through, there was a time when publishing was actually very exciting because apart from the greats that you cited, Aikwe and Ama, we had writers who were writing popular fiction. There was a series called Who, who Killed Lucy and When the Heart Decides and the whole country was reading. But after we had a series of military coup, there was you know, a change in uh, the educational system. It was shortened and literature took a back seat, unfortunately. And so people would have just been, until recently, people have been more focused on passing exams, you know, just getting on and getting a career uh, that is going to pay them right away and not writing. But already we see a lot of young people coming up and who are writing books, you know, so yeah, there's even Nana Sechiyama who has uh, a book coming out next year. It's a nonfiction book about the, the sexual life of um, African women. That promises to be exciting. <laughs> wow, that, that's a really exciting scene that's uh, emerging in, in, um, in, in Ghana. I have to ask you because this is not typical. I don't think this is typical of Africa. I'm noticing there's a lot of women writers in that space, a lot more than you know we'd see here in Kenya or in other little other spaces across the continent. Is there a reason for this this uh, kind of uh, happening? Uh, it's it's actually interesting. I think that Ghana has always been a very matriarchal society where women have always been very strong. It was the colonialists, the British, who changed that, who brought patriarchy. So I think now, as we've been shedding off our colonial cloaks, the women are finding their, their, themselves again. And uh, uh, we even had a vice president who was a woman. And so women are the storytellers, in fact, in their homes. When, when I was young and we were growing up, we've always had this situation where the family would gather around the fire at at bedtime and tell stories. And women were the storytellers. Yeah, we had a few male storytellers, but women, the grandmothers, they've always been the storytellers. So I think that um, Ghanaian women have just found their voice and they are beginning to really amplify their voices. There's so many women out there who are just raring to go. We don't have that many young men coming up. And maybe also the men are thinking there's not enough money. I don't know. But I don't think that is the case. I think it's just women are, you know, just exciting to be exercising their voices. Yeah. Well, that's that's really interesting, Busy. Um, maybe we can bring you in here, Zoe. Um, we've been chatting about German publishing on this uh, podcast for the last few few uh, few episodes, and. Um, what I'm coming to realize is, you know, it's a it's a big space. You know, ever since um, um, Gutenberg uh, borrowed, sorry, invented the printing press, and, and um, uh, since that period, uh, the German publishing space has been a really huge. You know, we're seeing huge publishing houses. We're seeing, you know, big festivals and fairs like the Frankfurter Buchmesse. And what does it look like for somebody who's one person inside the system for you? Um, from from which point of view? From a writer's point of view or a publisher's point of view? From a writer. From a writer. Um, what does it look like? Um, I, I, I'm so in, 
I, I find it so interesting what, what was just said about uh, the women being the storytellers. And um, we have many, many women writing in Germany as well. But um, again, it's through what you mentioned about the patriarchal society. Um, the most it, it's mostly men who get the awards who win the awards and it's mostly men who get the really really big um contracts and uh, the big money for publishing their books it, it's still a bit like this uh we or us women we actually sat down and, and counted um who won which award and uh, in, in germany or internationally and it's mostly actually men except when it comes to genre fiction um genre fiction which isn't considered uh serious highbrow literature of course and so this is where women are allowed to take more space i think like writing romance or crime fiction the, the moment um a book is considered uh, more serious literature then of course it's it's um better to to put a male name on it it's uh, it, it's still like this even though there are far more women working in the publishing industry than men but uh, most of the bosses of course are still men and um yeah so there there is a lot of things we we still need uh, to work on a lot of things we probably will have to change or want to change during the next few years and um from from well, more more generally speaking, I would say that um, yes, the publishing industry it's it's uh, still uh, flourishing. Uh, maybe even thanks to Corona in a way, because the bookshops um, the bookshops were closed for a, for a time, but. Um, all these these owners of the bookshops say they, they develop new ideas of how, how to keep in contact with um, with their customers, and so um, their situation wasn't that bad, and people started reading more. Uh, of course, at the same time, with all the um, with all the book fairs not taking place, that that was really a disaster. Um, but more people wanted to pick up books and wanted to read or they wanted to read more than they usually did. So um, I think the situation in Germany is, is quite good still. Hopefully it will remain like this and hopefully the, all the book fairs will come back. And um, we, we can, maybe next year we, we can do more readings, etc. I mean, you know what it's like, I, I don't think you can have, can you have readings and book presentations or? No, no, no. I mean, we have like, like really like small ones in the space I'm in. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, like um, your writing, you know, uh, ever since you wrote uh, When It Dawns in 2008 has been crime. I mean, that's been one of your, uh, mm -hmm. one of your spaces. And you've even been, been given an award for, you know, services to, you know, German women's crime. What what type of crime are they writing? Is it um, is it the same crime we see that is reflected from via Hollywood from the English uh, detective crime genre, or is there is it a unique way of writing? Um, I think you could say that the um, crime genre fiction is so is so diverse and so uh, broad that um, everything is possible, and th there is no a certain way of writing crime fiction in, in Germany. We, we never had a distinct tradition as the, the British or, or the Americans, um, but we started from, not, not really. Um, what used to be, like two decades ago, what, what used to be um, very popular was this kind of cozy crime fiction, regional crime fiction, where, where you needed a, a certain um, a certain area and uh, maybe a rural area even, and uh, things shouldn't be too bloody, not too gory. And uh, then there was a new trend saying that you needed a kind of serial killers and uh, you uh, your protagonist uh, had to find uh, 
some guy who tortured blonde, young, beautiful <laughs> women in their basements. I don't know. There are always certain, <laughs> certain popular subgenres. But um, what I write, I, I, I don't. I don't have a detective protagonist. I, I focus on um, women protagonists. Mm -hmm. I focus on, of course, di diversity while writing and um it's more it's more political things that i try to to address and uh, but, but but not the the uh, the typical who done it and not the typical um thriller as you can see it on on the screen um the you're giving us a, a, a prize for women's crime is it like it's a big thing or is it a small thing that you are elevating oh, what was the it's a prize from women for women, so nobody notices it, of course. Wow. I mean, except for the women. <laughs> <laughs> well, we noticed it. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to see more, more from that space. Um, maybe no, 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 but you, you hardly get any press coverage for this. Um, I wish there were, there were more prizes for women writers or just for women. But the thing is that if it's a prize for an award just for women, then it's hardly noticed anywhere, and nobody really wants to write about it because it's just for women, so it can't be it can't be a proper it can't be a proper award. And as there is hardly any money in it, um, then uh, of course nobody writes about it. It's I, I'm sorry to say it like this, but <laughs> this is so disturbing, man. Um, so the the thing is, it means that the, the the system is so big that they can even ignore the women very easily, and, and nobody will complain. Okay, uh, BC, maybe you can tell us what, um, um, uh, you know, you, you, your, your book is um, of women and frogs, you know, it has a young protagonist uh, who is Nigerian and Ghanaian. Um, I, I don't like saying half because you're fooled everything. <laughs> and uh, there's no such thing as a half person. You, you discover, that. yeah, yeah. I mean, this is somebody who, this is a, a story with the sexuality at the center of, uh, uh, at the center of it. Why did you pick this theme? And is it something that's very, very common in German, or, I mean, sorry, in Ghanaian writing? Because you know, you mentioned just now somebody's coming out with a sex book and, 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 and the like. <laughs> it's actually not at all common. I'm the first person to write. And it's uh, been a very, very popular book just because people normally don't write about sex. And I find it a very interesting because it's as, int you know, as important as nutrition, as eating, as life, as the air you breathe. But, you know, some years ago, now things have changed a lot. I was right. I set the book at a certain time period. And during that time, women were not supposed to be sexual at all. And men, you know, had all the power. And if a woman was curious about sex, then the person was immediately branded a prostitute or something awful like that, you know? So uh, that was uh, something that was not at all popular. And so I deliberately created a, a very, very innocent and raw person who was prepared to just ask very tough questions and was prepared to get into trouble was prepared to be like somebody who tastes ice cream and go, oh my God, it's good. And then, you know, she gets into trouble for it. And so that is something that had never been done before. Now, Nana Sechiyama, who, whose book is coming out next year, she had, you know, for different reasons, has been actually running a sex seminar every page at Literary Festival. And I didn't know why. It's a subject that she's very interested in. And I think that it's born out of a lot of trauma that a lot of young girls have experienced. Because even now, you know, girls are branded um, prostitutes if they're a little too, too eager. And I'm sorry I keep doing this, but for some reason that earphones will stay inside. But anyway, that is what is happening here. So it was very important for me to write about it and to write about it without any artifice and to be really, really raw without being, you know, pornographic because I see pornography as a type of literature that is um, for the purpose of titillating and I'm not criticizing that either, but this was not the purpose. 
it, it was not supposed to titillate you, although you might find some titillating seeds, but it was really supposed to examine and ask questions. And by the way, if you do hear a lot of shouting, I think they may have announced whoever mm. won their election. So there's a lot of jubilating and shouting in my neighborhood. So <laughs> I'm assuming the former president won because I think my neighborhood voted for him. So okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. I, I don't mean the former president, I mean the current president. Okay, the, the incumbent. Okay. Yes, the incumbent, yes. So, um, uh, and, and uh, ladies, remember, you can ask each other the questions that you, you, know, you feel that you need to ask. Um, yeah. For somebody who, uh, who published this book in the recent past, how is the process of getting a book published from uh, when you're in Ghana, you know, from the time you come up with the manuscript to the time you get the book in your hand? Okay, so I was living in America when I wrote this, and it was actually going to be published in America. And I had a deal with Simon and Schuster that fell through. And afterwards, you know, my heart was broken, and I was moving to Ghana. So I decided to submit to an African publisher. But I have to say that before then, uh, between 2004 and 2008, I lived in Ghana. I was a teacher here and I had a book. And by the way, that's my second book too that has been acquired by um, HarperCollins that is also going to come up after Of Women and Frogs is released. But I wrote that book first actually, before Of Women and Frogs. And a publisher offered me, I think $300 for it. And I said, no. And I think that that is the thing that really upsets me about publishing in Ghana in particular, because publishing on the African continent is hard as a rule. And most publishers don't offer you an advance, which is okay because they don't, you know, most publishers are small, they don't have the money to offer any kind of advance, but they offer you royalties. When somebody wants to buy the book outright for $300, that's really, pretty insulting and mm -hmm. apparently uh, that is what had been the, the person had offered to Amate do for the publication of one of her books and I found that really really upsetting because you spent literally that that's daughter in exile you mm -hmm. spent literally how many years writing a book and then somebody wants to go ahead and pay you uh, $300 I mean even a house girl here earns probably about maybe $200 or something like that a month. Not that they shouldn't be paid well because they also need to, to live well. So I found that upsetting and I turned them down. And so I decided to go to Nigeria because I didn't really know much about the publishing scene in Ghana, apart from this one publisher that was the biggest that I knew. And Nigerians, I felt, and I still feel that they are, you know, they started earlier. The, there's Kachifo and there's Paresia, you name it. You've got Weeda books, you've got Narrative Landscape, and now this new one, Masobi books that has come. And so I, I submitted to them. I just, they, you know, they had a submission portal and I just went through the submission uh, process and it worked very, very fine for me. Now, since that time, I've got to know different publishers. We have publishers like Dapabli Publishers. Now, they are the one publisher that I can say in Ghana. They do traditional publishing and they don't offer you any advance, but they offer you a reasonable um, percentage royalties. And I have to say, they publicize their authors. I think the one thing that I have found very disappointing is that most publishers here don't publicize their authors at all. And the reason is because they don't really rely on their authors for money. Many of them get, um, they publish actually mainly educational books and they get a lot of grants from the government. For instance, this particular publisher I was talking about at some point had actually boasted to me that he had received $3 million from the government. So if you have somebody, you know, giving you money, you don't feel this pressure to really promote your authors and to make money from the books that you are publish, publishing traditionally. So I assumed that there were no traditional publishers in Ghana. And 
I was surprised. Uh, in preparation for this event, I started talking to many publishers, and there are many publishers who are, in fact, publishing traditionally. Nobody just hears about the authors, that's all. And the authors don't go anywhere beyond the small confines. And I think most publishers do this. And even in Nigeria, they do that. They offer self-publishing alongside traditional publishing. And they use money from those paying to get their books published to support you know, the other venture. So that is the problem. And the other problem too is that after the coup, and the educational system was trunc truncated and literature was really reduced in the schools, many people stopped reading. Um, and now there is a thirst, there is a growing thirst. The biggest book club, it's called uh, Ghana Must Read and it has branches in just about every major city. There are so many book clubs cropping up, led mostly by women, yay, as usual. And so books are now beginning to mushroom and uh, uh, that's my reason for opening Bakoye uh, books, because I want to show that there is a way, and maybe I probably won't make any money, but I want to really, really make reading sexy again, make being an author sexy. I want to you know, do something like what you've been doing in Kenya, artistic encounters, bring a musician alongside a writer and just try to find creative ways to make writing, you know, sexy, writing exciting, bringing wine, bringing all kinds of things just to make it exciting. So we are at, we are on the cusp of something and I really believe we can get there soon. I, I like that. You said wine. I'm happy with that. Um, <laughs> Uh, I join uh, yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I just want to go back to this issue with the publishers. So, you, you don't see yourself using agents. Uh, no, there's no one using agents. You go straight to the publisher. You go straight to the publisher. Now, if you want to use agents, and that means you are trying to publish abroad. So, I had an agent, but it was a New York agent. I published um, a, a short story in Max Sweeney's, which was nominated for uh, the Kane Prize. And uh, so based on that story, a, a, a New York agent approached me and asked to represent me and to, you know, show my books. And that is how the Simon and Schuster deal almost happened, right? And so mm -hmm. even this deal with Harper Collins, I, you know, fortunately, I had written a second book and your lovely, lovely spouse, Zukiswa, who is, I would like to call her the godmother of, uh, of, of writers in Africa. She is just such a big support. And she happened to recommend me to this agent. Now, although it, the book deal didn't come through her, it helped that I had an agent because she was able to negotiate a fair price for me. And she was able to also, initially the, the editor had only heard of, of Women and Frogs. So he went, she went ahead and submitted both books and then now I have a two book deal. So most people who have agents have agents from outside. There is not a single uh, literary agent in Ghana. Thank you, thank you, BC. Um, so maybe we can get Zoe in here. I'm interested yeah. about your pub. Yeah, I'm interested about your publishing house. But um, I looked at your at your bio, and there's some things which I I would like you to clarify. It says you're a book dialogue author and dubbing director. Are those yeah. real jobs? What are those? <laughs> yeah, those real jobs, of course. I've never heard of them. I mean, <laughs> I mean, okay. What are they? Um, we have this really long sounding tra tradition in Germany uh, where we don't watch original movies, but um, the dub the, uh, version. Okay. So all the actors speak German out of a sudden. And okay. um, this wonderful tradition, we, we, we have subtitles, of course. And uh, if, if you talk to people when you, when you go to a party and you talk to people and, you, uh, and, and it's, it's about dubbing and Everybody says, oh, I only watch the original version, which, of course, isn't true. But um, we do this um, sync, lip sync dubbing. And, so is um, it like karaoke for books? Sorry? Is it, like, is it like karaoke for books or something? No, no, no. I'm talking about film. I'm talking about TV. 
Oh, 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 what, what do you mean? No, yeah, please, I, I was just trying to, please continue, finish your thoughts. Uh, no, um, so what, what we do is, um, well, if, if, you, if you write the, um, the script for the dubbed version, then of course you have to, you have to, to watch the lips and mm. it, has to be, it has to fit the lips. And mm. um, that's what I do. And uh, then I go to the um, studio with the, um, with, the, with the voice artists, they're usually actors, and um, we record it. And uh, yeah, so that it looks good and that it sounds good. This is this is what we what we do, and it's like the other fifty percent of my life. So it's fifty so percent something with books, and the, the other part is something with uh, dubbing and directing. Yeah. So so that's the dubbing side. What about the book dialogue part? That's just what 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 we need before we go to the studio and, and Oh, yeah. okay. So it's the pre preparation to go to yeah. go to studio. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. I that mean, is I, so I, fascinating. I just love the idea because I find it, I've always, you know, I, I didn't understand the skill that went into matching the foreign language words with, you know, the way that the lips are shaped and that kind of thing. And sometimes it sounds so good that you think that the people are actually speaking a foreign yes. language. And so it takes talented people like you to make it happen, eh? Absolutely. Yes. I'm doing my best, but but this this is what we of course um, want in the end as a result. But um, I mean, um, I'm, I just mentioned parties. That, so there are two things happening when I, when I come to a party and and start talking to people. The first thing is I talk about dubbing, and people say I only watch the original version, and then they tell me uh, about how how. Uh, how badly the dubbing is usually done, which of course is, um, I mean, you, it, it's the same with translations. You cannot always put everything from the original meaning into the other language. You always have to make compromises. And uh, then with dubbing, it's uh, sometimes even a bit worse because uh, maybe uh, the original sentence is far too long or far too short or whatever. Anyway, and the other thing at parties is when, when I mentioned I write crime fiction is that people say, I read everything except crime fiction. So, um, <laughs> so just to get back to the book's topic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, so um, Talking about agents, um, I think agents, uh, literary agents, have become very, very, very important in in Germany, especially um, during the past ten or fifteen years. And um, I personally am a big fan of having an agent as a writer. Uh, it, I, I think in, in in Germany it's kind of crucial because um, they help you find the right publishing house. They help you with the contracts. They help you with all the questions um, regarding like foreign rights or film rights or whatever. So this is uh, really important. Um, of course, if, if you, uh, as a writer, if you want to work together with a very small publishing house where they can't pay a lot, um, and then you have to give 15% to an agent, then that of course hurts, but um, Generally speaking, I would say that uh, trying to find an agent who helps you find the right publishing house and get the right deal. So um, it, it's, it, it's, it has become quite common here. And I, I think it's a very good, um, it's a very good thing. It, it helps a lot, but um, the publishing scene this has become vast. So you need someone to help you find your way. Wow. Um, so maybe uh, we can now... Uh -huh. Go on. I was going to say that it's somebody, you know, there was a, a text that flashed and a person said, but are, are there literary agents in Africa? And I wanted to say yes. I know that there are, in fact, literary agents in South Africa, for instance. And I know they've been a, there are a couple in Nigeria. And you probably know Kenya better than I do. Uh, so we don't have because the, the the publishing industry in ghana is just so young uh well it took a hiatus and then it's now growing again 
it doesn't seem to make sense. And it's also such a small community that all the population you can to teach the same. It's uh, they use the same form, the same uh, the same percentages and all that. So it doesn't seem to be necessary. And I think to Zoe's point, if the money is very little and you're making like say five hundred, you're lucky if you're getting five hundred dollars and you have to give. 15% of it to somebody else. I don't even know if that agent wants to even work for you. Is it worth the agent's time? And so as the industry grows and the agents find it, you know, uh, profitable, I think we will see, soon start to see that because to Zoe's point, it's really very important. Um, for instance, there were things in my first contract that if I had, you know, had the somebody was interested in that, I may not have agreed to a lot of the things that were in there. Uh, many fellow writers with agents said to me, oh my God, I would never have agreed to that. We shouldn't have signed that contract, you know. So um, it really is important to have an agent. But for now in Ghana, it, it's not worth it. And uh, maybe one day we'll get there. Yeah, it's not worth it for you and it's not worth it for the agent. Yes. <laughs> Um, so I think uh, that one day it's going to be worth it. Um, yes, and yes. Everybody's going to and there, and that's why I really want to help grow the literary scene here to make it truly a viable business, and not just a viable business, but but, but good, for goodness' sake, I feel as though literature is the heart of the people, is the soul of the people, it's where people express themselves, it's where we get enlightenment and ideas grow and we grow as a society and as a country. So if literature is dead, then we are all going to just be dead and just be chasing after money and not, you know, becoming like robots and playing video games or perish the thought, right? So we need books, yes. Video oh, we... games can be interesting. But yes, and somebody has to write the stories for the video yes. games anyway. But just say yes, yes, yeah, <laughs> absolutely right. Actually, so, not that. Yeah, so maybe we can ch chat That's about. My uh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we we've been talking about about Bakoye books, so maybe we can talk about culture books. Um, uh, you set it up in 2013, and um, uh, that's the right year, right? 2013. Yeah. Yes. And um, I noticed that um, when I was looking through your portfolio, one of the first things I noticed is that you also you went with your crime um, background, and uh, you're you're behind uh, public you had behind um, anthologies like Paris Noir and uh, Berlin Noir with Akashic. Uh, mm -hmm. How did that come about? Um, well, it's I, I wouldn't say this is this is regular crime as in detective fiction. Of course, it's more um, noir. Uh, the noir genre, they uh, they were introduced to us and um, we found this idea um, not just interesting because of the genre, but uh, more interesting because of um, the possibility to travel the world. And uh, I mean, there, there are many, many African countries uh, as a part of this series and, and many... Um, like Latin American or Asian countries, and this is this is more what we are interested in, um, like um, presenting literature, presenting books from all over the world, and I think with uh, like crime stories or noir stories in that case, you can make it um, sometimes easier for, for for people to to become interested in a different culture, and we. Um, we only just got started printing. We, when we started in 2013, um, we were um, a publishing house only for digital um, editions for ebooks. And we thought that the uh, ebook uh, sales would go up a bit more and that maybe people would uh, start um, reading more. Uh, digital versions, but uh, in Germany they obviously didn't, and so we had to find a new way of, of publi uh, publishing um, interesting stories. We we thought um, publishing it um, digitally 
if there is a, if there is a, like a short story, um, then that's easier and, and easier to access. Um, because printing, of course, is uh, is expensive, and, and and trying to get the, the the books out there on on the shelves that's expensive. So um, yeah, but well, I, I think it was a good idea, but it didn't really, as I said, it didn't really work out. So we had to start printing. Um, uh, before you went on, why you changed? Oh. Before you tell us why you changed, huh? um, is yeah. there something about the publishing and scene in Ger in Germany that didn't allow you know the digitals, the digital to take hold? Because I thought it was the buzzword three or four years ago. Hmm. Is it a German publishing thing, or is it just a publish? Um, it, um, because you, it, you must have found out why it wasn't working. I think. The Germans still want their bookshelves in their homes. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you can't really show off uh, with uh, a digital bookshelf. No, um, <laughs> seriously. What, what works really, I love reading ebooks. I love reading ebooks. I do. Um, but the thing is, um, what works really well as ebooks is um, our genres like. Um, like erotic literature, of course. I mean, you don't want to be called on the train. <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> so that works really well. Or just, um, you know, that there are some, there are some are readers. You, you who, hide it inside another book. <laughs> I mean, you don't need to do this if you have just your mobile phone or your e-reader and then you can just read the Fifty Shades of Grey and somebody asks you, what, what is it that you read and they go to? No. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I, I don't know. The, the numbers just stopped at a certain level and then just didn't didn't go up. And um, what we tried to do was uh, we, we wanted to publish uh, not genre fiction, not genre literature, but but more experimental stuff and more literary stuff. Mm -hmm. And people who are interested in this kind of literature, they want the book in their hands. They want to show it to their friends. They, they, they just want to be seen with the books. They want to touch the books and they want to feel the texture of the cover or whatever. Yeah. And I think, I mean, maybe that's the reason. I don't know. Uh, it's just and maybe the prices were too high. We have this um, this uh, wonderful German word Buchpreisbindung, which means a fixed price for books, and this uh, also goes for for uh, e-books. And so e-books are compared to proper books, to real books. Uh, e-books are rather expensive, so maybe that's mm -hmm. another problem. Just adding to it. So we started printing in like two thousand. 15, but properly in 2017. And then, of course, we had to um, start somewhere with uh, beloved international authors, of course. And uh, we also started this um, Akashic series with the um, noir stories. It's it's a lovely way to, to get to know new, new writers or different writers, writers you, you've never heard of before. And um, I'd like to, to continue with... Um, with more stories from from more African countries, of course. Oh uh, yes, um, Accra uh, Noir just came out, by the way. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and I believe there's Addis Ababa, there's Johannesburg, that there's Nairobi, and there's Lagos. Lagos. So there's five. <laughs> so far, yeah. there's five. Yeah. Um, uh, but, I mean, do you uh, have any questions? I... Uh, can I Sorry, add to what Zoe was saying? Because that's very important. This is what I have struggled with. Um, I've just registered a publishing company and I have not been able to decide where, in which direction to go, whether to go with e-books or, or to go with physical books. I find that in Ghana here, more people want um, their e-books. But at the same time, you know, they're thinking of, of, of of their data uh internet and their power i mean i think that if they just have something they, they if they have the kindle that they could download onto that would be great because printing books here as a publisher in ghana it's really extremely hard people it's not that it's hard it's very expensive and i don't understand why it is so so expensive and so if you publish a book locally it makes the book very expensive 
So I found out um, in studying Nigerian publishers and talking to them is that every th book that they publish, they have the books printed in India. And it is cheaper, even with the shipping costs and, and taxes and everything, it's far cheaper. And I'm talking about 10 times cheaper mm -hmm. to, to get those books printed in Asia than to get them printed in, in Africa. And when I talk to a printer that I've been trying to coax into printing more books, because we do have people who are printing, and their explanation is that, first of all, the printing machines are just so expensive to get. Hmm. And it's it's just so hard, and 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 also customs in Ghana, the taxes are way too high. If you have to import anything for business, um, they the 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 tax you have to pay is just so high that it doesn't make it profitable. So it's just so much easier to just. Uh, email this company in India and have them ship the books to you. And then, because books are not that valued. So when the books come to customs, they, you hardly pay anything for the books. So so I've been thinking about that. And, and in that case, that means I have to have a physical place to store or say two, 3,000 mm -hmm. books that come and where am I going to store them? So these are some of the extent a lot have been, um, I told you about that public, says they are the most dynamic, have been publishing um, physical books, but uh, I, I'm really not sure how they do it. They probably are storing the books in their houses, and maybe that's what I have to start with. Right now, start storing books in a spare bedroom and see how I go from there. But it, it's really not easy trying to navigate the e-book versus the physical mm -hmm. book. Yeah, but, um, but, but it sounds as if as if uh, uh, ebooks were the better option to to start with. Um, yeah, I mean, this is what globalization and capitalism does to to the book market. Um, I I'm sure that uh, printing books in India might even be cheaper for us, but uh, we we only print in 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 Germany. But then books are very are quite expensive in Germany and they have to be especially if they're printed here. Yeah. Yeah. A busy yeah, I start with ebooks. Yeah. I, I can I only recommend it. I take consolation in what uh, Lola Shonayid is doing in Nigeria with her digital platform that she has created. And it's actually doing very well. And she's able to pay office quite well too. Mm -hmm. So that's something uh, to look at, maybe some partnership with digital platforms and and to see how I go from there. But definitely, I think that it would be easier to start with the digital and then see how you navigate that. Mm. Oh. But, um, but uh, do, do you have uh, the chance to do uh, something like uh, print on demand? Uh, no. Well, I, it does exist, but again, like I'm saying, the unit price is so expensive. Okay. I try that. When you're talking about a book, in a country where the average salaries are, say, a thousand, uh, two thousand, let's say, two thousand mm -hmm. um, CDs for the average middle class person, and the unit cost of printing a book is about a hundred and fifty CDs. So, how much do you add to it to make it worth it? Now, who wants to use a quarter or so of their salary to buy one single book? And that is what makes it expensive. So printing mm. shorter books, smaller books, well, not, not uh, like, I'd say, a two, 300 page novel, but maybe say you go for um, shorter books with about, say, 100 pages, 100, uh, the unit price cheaper, and that will, will help a little bit. But it's just mm -hmm. so, I, I actually explored all that and it was so ridiculously expensive. Now I found a young man who is printing books. Uh, his father had the, the machines and, and, and just, you know, I think the father probably sadly passed away. And so it, he's a student and in his spare time, he prints books. And uh, so he would do it for, you know, far cheaper, but the problem, that he has his access to good quality paper. Mm -hmm. It's also 
exported uh, for a country that produces lots of, we have so many cotton trees. I wish we could, you know, produce good quality paper. Yeah, looks really cheap and tacky. And so. Yeah. But, 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 but if there are already good uh, platforms uh, for, for literature and uh, for selling uh, ebooks, then just go ahead with the ebooks. Then yeah. you already have the names out there and you have the stories out there. I still believe it's a very, very, very good thing to start with. Yes, yes. So ebooks definitely are better to start with because the print books, yeah. you know, can be expensive. And and uh, you, I, I kind of I shy away from the idea of importing books from India because I think mm -hmm. to myself, yeah, in the, in Asia is getting richer and richer and richer because you know, and and the more or orders they get, the, the, the more they can afford to sell things to us cheaply, but then the more it hits our local business. Um, yeah. That's a thing to do. I have to say that, you know, the public is trying to find a way to print only locally. And, and I have to say, I really admire them. I think you've met James. Have you met Nana Redamwa? He's no, I haven't met him yet. Oh, okay. I I think uh, Zukiswa met him, but he's the one half of it. And I also remember um, talking to Lola and what, what she was saying to me was that, yeah, it's very expensive to print locally, but she, uh, a couple of years ago, took that decision to stop printing from Asia and to give more business to Nigeria. And that's what we need to, you know, get creative and look for ways to keep the money and to, to give people jobs within the country. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. Yeah. So BC, I mean, uh, I mean, oh, this is our last show. So one of the things I have to ask you is um, how, how was uh, 2020 for you as a writer slash publisher? Because I know you've been talking, you know, we've been, so <laughs> how was 2020 for you? Well, initially it was, a shock. I was stunned and I became paralyzed and I couldn't write and I couldn't read, I couldn't do anything. However, um, I found that this, just being able to connect with other writers online and also I realized that I had far more time to read. So I just decided to start reading more and I started to read more. And then they you know, chatting with Zukiswa and the others and coming up with the Afro Lit Sam Frontier that uh, Zukiswa started with the original 16 of us. It became, for me, I think that 2020 actually. And well, really I, mean, uh, uh, I mean, what is Afro Lit Sam Frontier? Because some people might not know what that is. Okay, so it is, um, African, the promotion of African literature, it was started by Zuki. You know, jumped on it because we fell an idea. And this whole idea of being able to uh, bring together African writers, and not just African writers, but the reason we say Sam Frontier is all writers of Afro you know, descendants. So we have, we could have, say, we've had uh, Brazilian authors. Uh, we had Maurice Conde, for instance. And, and so it's not limited to just Africa, but Africans in the diaspora. And so the first festival, initially when we started, we just, everybody was so depressed about COVID that we just wanted to amuse people. So the theme of the first one was just to read sexual passages from our books and just to entertain our authors. And also all the literary festivals had been canceled and we thought, hey, why not just entertain people? And to our surprise, it caught fire and people, writers were reaching out to us, to Zukiswa especially, say can we be on your list and then we just started to, to then we got more serious you know um, but even though we got serious we decided to keep the spirit of africa we've danced on the sh on, on on we've danced we've we've drunk wine we've we've recited poetry we've done different things but this is one way that we thought we could give back to the society uh, as a whole and so in doing that it created this scenario where we got to know, I mean, for instance, I, there were so many African writers I didn't know. And I got to know so many people who were just names to me. And we get together. Mm -hmm. 
GM, GMT just means as an event, and we all descend to go and troll the person and ask just provocative questions, questions that you don't expect at a, uh, a book event. Like somebody will ask you, choose, what do you like, poetry or cocaine? Which would you rather have? You know, just, just trying to amuse the public. And it has really been wonderful. So for me, I would say 2020 has been really good. And it was through Afrolit that I met fellow writers and and people who introduced me to editors and whatnot and introducing me to an agent. And that is what has led to what is happening in my career. And there has been a lot of networking going on. We are very supportive emotionally of one another. We cheer one another on and we're just trying to help amplify the African voices. And I think, in fact, it was Afrolit that got me to start a literary, um, the, a publishing company. Because if you remember during uh, the whole publishing paid me, it, it was a Twitter thing that went viral where you know the, uh, people of color felt as though they were not being published well and they were not being paid as well as some other, other writers. And so, we felt that we needed to come together to create a, a union that would be strong. And so we're trying to link all our publishing agencies. So for instance, if, I, if, if Zukiswa publishes Pavivo, publishes something in, in Kenya, I could take the manuscript because we found that one of the most difficult things in Africa is that we don't trade with one another. Africa is a vast continent. And let me tell you, it's far more expensive to fly sometimes to Senegal than to fly to Europe or fly into South Africa. And so we don't trade with one another. Send it, uh, I sent a book to a fellow writer in Namibia and the book went through, I don't know, was it Amsterdam or something like that? It took three weeks for the book to get to him. And yet I sent a book to um, Maza Mengisti no, Maza actually sent me a book from Zurich and it took 48 hours. And I sent her a book to New York and it took 48 hours. And so why is it like that? So we decided, and back to the electronic thing, that we there is a way that we could send one another PDF files and print the books locally to help our fellow writers. So my, my real main goal for establishing the the publishing house is to help fellow African writers who are not in West Africa. I can have a writer uh, send me a manuscript from South Africa, from Namibia, from anywhere, Ethiopia, and then we can, and vice versa, and we can help to publicize one another's books. So for me, 2020 has been really, really good as a writer. And at the same time, it's, 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 it's really sad because of the number of people who have died and just what is happening in the world. So, Zoe, how has your 2020 been? Weird and wild at the same time, um, or maybe because of. Uh, I, I had just written a book about uh, what society might look like 100 years um, in the future after like several generations of uh, people who, who had to suffer from pandemics. And I wrote this book before Corona, you know. And so I thought, okay, now we have Corona. And I, I, I wrote something about a society after all those big pandemics uh, had taken place and nobody's going to read it. But it became a bestseller uh, out of a sudden. I, I'd never expected that. But so, um, in a way, in, in a very, uh, I have to, I'm saying this with uh, very mixed feelings that Corona for my book was in a way a good thing. It's not good to say that. It doesn't feel good to say that. But um, yeah, however, um, so the, the positive aspects of um, this very weird situation um, were, as you just said, BC, um, that I could connect um, digitally with so many different people I probably would never have met uh, in real life. 
uh, under normal conditions because out of a sudden um, somebody had the idea to do something with uh, South American countries, for example, or this, this wonderful um, African literature uh, festival promoting African literature. Um, so all these wonderful things happened um, online and I could access them and I could just watch them or sometimes I was uh, even invited. And that was for me, a wonderful experience, even though I'm, I'm always here in, in, in my living room, but um, somehow I could uh, travel the world from uh, digitally <laughs> and get to know, uh, get to know new people. Um, yeah, and the, the political situation or rather the, the, the what, what, what's happening in, in Germany, um, I mean, compared to other countries, the situation, the Corona situation is quite okay in in a way it's it's not really good but it's not a disaster the way it was in italy in the beginning or the way it is for example in the us but um how people react to this situation it made me think a lot about um what can you write in the future and how can you write books how can you write fiction uh in in the future to do, 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 do you have to do you have to consider what's going on here, or can can you can you actually think of um, think of uh, maybe some something completely uh, completely new um, regarding uh, political systems, for example? So so I, I've been thinking a lot about uh, what is going on and what this might mean for my writing, and um, yeah, now I'm just uh, waiting for this to. To be over and i'm hoping that it's not going to be back to normal but back to not not back but but on to to something better for all of us hopefully how are you looking how are you seeing 2021 Zoe? sorry how do you see 2021 I don't know. I've given up making plans. <laughs> <laughs> no more plans. <laughs> and you busy? No plans? Uh, no plans other than to get my book out. And I have no idea what is going to happen. Because 2020, I had so many plans and everything went completely haywire. So, but I have to say, I, I just want to come back to the topic of afro lit and frontier uh what i was trying to say because there's a question that came in is uh, this whole idea of having co-editions uh in africa and that's exactly what we are trying to do with uh the uh your book your publishing house Pavivo. am i pronouncing it correctly uh Pavivo. Pavivo. and 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 kiela on Jackie in Angola has just established Kiela, which will be publishing books. And we've been trying to get uh, some funding so that we can do this. And what we're trying to do is Natasha's book, for instance, came out by Blackbird Books. And so we want to partner with all the other publishers so that we don't have to worry about distribution and we can actually publish those books uh, locally under our own printing, uh, our own imprint, but then we are helping to distribute the books and we don't have to worry about shipping books from one region to another. Because in fact, this is what uh, uh, from Nigeria, for instance, problem of the lockdown. So how do you get books? And so this is what we are in fact trying to do, but this hasn't existed before, unfortunately but this has been a wake up call 2020 has showed us that this is something that we need in africa so we're going to make it happen taking it over or taking over the world one book at a time yes one book at a time yes <laughs> Th thank you so much ladies uh, do you have any any questions for yourself uh, for each other before I, I i wrap up this up um bc if if you want to talk more about uh, digital publishing then just contact me and I see if I can be of any help, I'd be honored to stay in contact with you. Absolutely, I would love that very much. And uh, uh, otherwise, how are your cats doing? Oh, they're fine. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know whether anybody heard it, but um, 
the um, Oscar, the cat Oscar, he, he's a, a big fluffy uh, Garfield-like cat. He, he, he was sitting here next to me and uh, meowing the whole time. I, I don't know, did, did, did any of you hear it? I don't know, no, I, I tried no. to zoom away, but, but <laughs> they, they, they're fine. Thank you, thanks for asking. How, yeah. <laughs> yes. And I noticed too that you also played a piano. So we, there, there's so much to talk about. And but I, you have a grand piano. I'm so. <laughs> people who own grand pianos for me must be the luckiest, the happiest people in the world. Well, it was an old, old couple in America and they were downsizing. They wanted to move oh. into an apartment and they didn't want to take it with them. And so they advertised it and they were selling it for only a thousand dollars. And I said, I'm your wow. woman. <laughs> I happen and to did, did you play it regularly? Um, actually, it, you know, I had young children who play the piano and I, I grew up playing the piano a little, but I feel like such an imposter. I'm not really that good. I, I create more than I play, than I read. I don't really read that well. So I tend to create and I also play a lot by ear. If I hear That's anything, I can reproduce it on the piano. So that is great. how I play. And, um, it, so it sounds like fun, really. Yeah, keep going, <laughs> please. So, yeah. <laughs> This is a wonderful way to end uh, to end uh, the series today. Books, like, I want... cats, and pianos. There yes. you go. <laughs> Best is in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to say thank you, say thank you, Zoe. Thank you, BC, for being my final guest for 2020. If you've been watching this, this is the James Mudra Literary Podcast. I'm your go I'm your host, James Mudra. This is brought in partnership with the Frankfurter Book Messer. Uh, with funding from the for German Foreign Federal Office. And I want to say thank you for not just to Zoe and BC, but all the guests who've been coming, who's come through for the last few weeks. And I'd like to say thank you and goodbye, everybody. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Bye-bye. Thank you, James. It was so nice meeting you both. <laughs>